So today we're going to uh, st start looking at simple ciphers. So yesterday we looked at encoding messages, uh, how messages are represented in the digital domain. Uh, but we're on our way to retrace some of the steps that Elizabeth Friedman took to break all of those messages uh, in both world wars. Uh, so, so yesterday was about encoding. Um, and the idea of encoding is to apply a function to your information, like your characters, to generate the representation of the data. And so the, the thing about this is that it's all out in the open, right? It's not meant to actually trick you, right? You, once you know the function, then you can figure out what the meaning of that data is. Uh, but uh, today we're going to talk about encryption. And the idea here is to also apply a function to the information that you're going to uh, uh, represent. But you want to hide that function so that people can't understand what that information is. So that's encryption. Uh, today we're going to do some simple ways of encrypting your data. Uh, these are different kinds of ciphers. So there's the transposition, the monoalphabetic, and the polyalphabetic. And by the end of this, we're going to be scaffolding you up all the way up to the Enigma so that you can understand what the movie uh, tonight is uh, about. So we'll start with the easiest ones, the, the transposition cipher. Uh, the idea of the transposition cipher is to just shuffle the characters in the plain text. And then, uh, and then by scrambling the, the letters, uh, hopefully you uh, can hide the message itself. Uh, so here's the, probably the most famous example of this. How many of you play jumbles? Okay, so we're going to solve these as a group. What is the first one? Just yell it out. The second one. Uh -huh. I heard it. Lemur. Uh, the third one. Clinch. Uh, the fourth one. Degree. Okay, so that's not a very good cipher. You can all solve those things. So those are anagrams. Uh, you read in your letter that uh, four, he likes anagrams. So uh, let's see if he tries to give you any. Uh, the next transposition cipher is a columnar transposition. Uh, so the idea here is you arrange the message in a table. And then you reorder the columns of that table to do the shuffle. So here's the message that you want to uh, encrypt, defend the east wall of the castle. And what you would do is you would enter it into a table, row by row. And so in this case, the table has six columns, so six characters at a time. And then uh, as you go off the end of the table, you wrap around to the next row. So you see that there. And then what you do is you have a secret key. And the secret key is a German. It's just a word at the top. And you put it at the top row of that column. And so the key is the same length as the, the number of columns in your table. And then you just shuffle the, the columns. And in this case, the way we're going to shuffle is to put the col columns alphabetically in order. So A, E, G, M, N, R at the top is your alphabetical uh, ordering. And then you just take those columns underneath those letters and you swap them around. Okay, is that clear? Good? Need to make... Let me see. Okay. Uh, the next cipher I wanted to talk about is the Skittly cipher. And this was used by ancient Greeks to communicate during military campaigns. And uh, the key to this cipher is a rod. And the rod has a specific diameter. And that diameter is going to shuffle the letters of the message that's wrapped around it in a specific order. So this is what it looks like. You have your message wrapped around this rod and then you take strips that go around the rod and you pull off the characters of that message using that, that rod. So that's what it looks like pictorially. The better example is from Wikipedia, the source of all good things. So your plain text here is, help me, I am under attack. And you can envision the rod 
it's in two dimensional, uh, in 2D, but you can envision the rod and then you have your message, help me, I am under attack. And then you take columns of that and your plain text, which is in, in the rows, will turn into ciphertext in the columns. So H-E-N-T on the leftmost column, E-I-D-T, the second column, all the way to the right. And so that's your ciphertext at the bottom. Does that, let me blow this up so that you can just take a look at what this cipher is doing. So you're basically taking every nth letter, and when you're, so you take the H first, and then you're skipping a certain number of letters, and then you're getting the next letter, and then as you go all the way down through the message, when you're at the end of the message, you wrap around and you take the next letter from the, uh, the second position. Okay. So here's an example of decrypting. So if I give you this ciphertext, uh, and that's the one that from the previous uh, slide, then the way to decrypt a message like this, if you don't know the diameter of the rod, is to try out every diameter possible until you get English text back. So in this case, if I say, oh, um, I'm, I don't know what the period of the, of the encryption is, I'm going to pick three. I'm going to say every third letter is what I'm going to try. And so here, every third letter gives you H, T, D, A, P, C, and A. That doesn't seem like English, right? So then what you, what you do is you might want to try the, the next one. Maybe every fourth letter is what I need to look at. So in this case, if it's every fourth letter, uh, then I do H, E, L, P, M, and then I wrap back around to the front of the message, and then I see E, I, A, M, and then the third row is, you wrap back around to the front of the message again, and then you have N, D, E, R, and A, and then the final piece of this is the fourth letter, T, T, A, C, K. And then you can reconstruct this, you see that help me I am under attack appears. Are there any questions about decrypting a skiddly enciphered message? Are we good with that? Because we're going to have an activity. You're going to do this for yourselves. I thought you were going to do this for yourself. Oh, you are going to do this for yourselves. <laughs> So, six snippets, <laughs> uh, each table gets a, a pack of six, um, so every table should have six people in it. If you have more than six, if you can reshuffle so that you are at a table with six. Uh, so each one of these snippets has taken two to four words of a message and has shuffled them with a skiddly cipher. I want, it, uh, I want you to decipher your snippet and then put all the snippets together to generate a quote. Okay, so the next set of ciphers are the monoalphabetic ciphers. And uh, with these ciphers, the ordering is kept the same. Uh, but you're going to do a simple substitution of a plain text character to a ciphertext character. The simplest monoalphabetic cipher is the Caesar cipher. And uh, this was used by Julius Caesar to encrypt his messages. And the, the key part of the cipher is a wheel. And these are, this wheel has the inner part that can be rotated. So this, uh, this inner circle of letters could be rotated around. And based on your rotation, you are going to translate the plain text character on the outer ring to the cipher text character on the inner ring. And so the key is the position of your wheel in terms of decrypting that message. 
So how would you break a Caesar cipher? Say you're given this, like Julius Caesar sends a, <laughs> sends a message that has that in it. How would an adversary figure out how, what that message says? Yes. Yes, so that's exactly it. Brute force. There are, oh, oh what, what's that? No, I would try all 26. And then on average, you'd only have to do 13 of them. <laughs> so yes, just try all 26. And one of them will give you English, English, uh, an English word. And so this particular one, if you rotate the wheel long enough, you'll see that this actually is attack as, uh, as the plain text for this uh, message. So yeah, this is not very good cryptography. All you have to do is try 26 positions and see which one gives you back an English word. So uh, another class of cipher, if you want to do more than just 26 uh, ways of encrypting a message, is simple substitution. So uh, rather than a fixed mapping of characters, you can do an arbitrary mapping of plain text to ciphertext characters. Uh, the example I want to show is how many of you have ever done a magic ink workbook? Yeah, this used to be my favorite thing to do, but that was really, that was ages ago. I, do they still publish these things? We have that ink that, the dis, that, that um, reveals the, uh, the puzzle when you, when you color it in. Um, it looks like this. So you would be given a table of, and you can't see this, let me blow this up. This is your top secret message, and they give you that the uh, plain text characters on the top are going to be translated into these ciphertext character characters at the bottom. And then all you need to do is go along, and if you see this percent sign, look it up in the table and figure out what the plain text is. This is just a simple substitution cipher. Uh, the key is that the secret for this message is this mapping. But the mapping could be more than just 26. So it's a little bit harder to brute force. You have to do more, you have to, you have to try harder if you don't know what the key is. So in this case, they gave you the key, so it's easy. Um, so here's an example of a substitution cipher, enciphered message. Uh, how would you decode this? How would you try and break this? That's exactly it. You know that this is English, likely English text. So if you're looking at this, you see, let me see, there's two letter words right here. So the C and the P, it could be two, it could be on, it could be in, but there's a very small number of two letter words that it could be. So then you can start making some assumptions and then sort of reasoning about what those letters map into, yes. That's exactly it. So she says that you know what common letters are in the uh, English dictionary and, and, and in words. You know that there's, there probably needs to be a vowel in every word, unless you have zyge or something like that, rhythm. But like, there's very few words that don't have vowels, so you can start picking apart uh, that as well. So that's exactly how you would break a substitution cipher. And this is what someone like Elizabeth Friedman would look at a message and, and be able to tell, like, oh, um, you know, these might be vowels, these might be uh, certain letters based on, um, based on this. So here is a table, so this is exactly what uh, this table helps you to do. This is a character frequency uh, table of common letters in the English uh, language. So um, the letter E appears most frequently in English text, followed by T, A, O, I, and N. And then what you would do is you would look into the ciphertext and you would take the frequency of the enciphered characters and you would try and do a one-to-one -one mapping. So then what I would do is I would take this message. I'm trying to see if they can see that mouse. Is that good? Is that better? Okay. So what you would do is you would take the letters of this ciphertext and you would do a frequency analysis of the characters that are in there. And then that would give you a rough mapping of these enciphered characters to the plain text characters. 
And that's what this site helps you do. I forgot the name of this site. But on the right, uh, one of the things that it allows you to do is you take your ciphertext and you say, uh, what is the character frequency of the ciphertext for the particular uh, enciphered character? So P is the most common character in that bundle of characters that we saw on the left. And so maybe you can map that to E. And then one by one, pick off the, the, the ciphertext and map it back into the plain text. Does that make sense? Okay, this is something that's really done, if, uh, that's done a lot if you're analyzing uh, cryptographic messages. If you have an encryption scheme that does this, uh, that has this kind of mapping, you're in trouble. You, that's, not, that's not really going to be a secret. Okay, so the weakness of every single monoalphabetic cipher is that every character of the plain text translates into the exact same cipher text. So you can just do this analysis on all of them. And so the next step is to, instead of using one alphabet to do the substitution, I'm going to use a whole bunch of alphabets. And in fact, with Enigma, it's going to use tens of thousands of alphabet uh, sets. And we'll get to that next. But we're going to start with uh, simple polyalphabetic ciphers. So in this case, rather than using a single substitution mapping, you're going to use multiple substitution mappings. Uh, so polyalphabetic ciphers are just substitution ciphers that have multiple alphabets. And the classic one is the Visionaire cipher. So uh, the idea here is that you use multiple Caesar ciphers on the plain text, and then you have a secret key, the password that you're sharing with the other side, and that key, the letters in that key, will determine which Caesar cipher you're going to use. And then you're going to take that key and you're going to copy it across your plain text, and then every single character of the plain text gets enciphered by that particular Caesar cipher. I'm going to show you an animation of this uh, that shows how it works. But uh, the, the part of the Visionaire cipher that you're going to look at, you're going to have help uh, with this Visionaire table. And what this table does is it takes all 26 Caesar cipher positions, and it associates them with letters. So A through Z. At the top, uh, these are 26 Caesar cipher positions, and the column is the mapping between the plain text character and the cipher text character that you get back. So the key character, yeah. So the key character is going to, the secret key that you share is going to select which column you use. And then this is the Caesar cipher that you're going to use to encrypt the plain text to the cipher text. And so what you'll, what you'll do is the plain text will be here on the row. And then you're going to use the key character to select a column. And the intersection between the plain text and the key, uh, the key character is going to be your cipher text. So I'm going to, I'm going to show another, a better example of this. So uh, we're going to encrypt a message. And the message that we're going to encrypt is foobar followed by six A's. And the key that I'm going to give you is PSU. So that's the secret key that we share. And uh, the way this works, the algorithm for encrypting this message, is to first take that key and cycle it across the plain text. So what I mean by that is that you're going to copy that key over and over again onto the plain text. And then you're going to take columns of the plain text and the key. So for example, the first column is P and F. The first entry of that column, P, is going to set the column for the Caesar cipher that you're going to use. So in this case, the first letter is P. And what you're going to do is you're going to take the plain text, F, and that's going to set the row that you're going to use. And where they meet, is the ciphertext that you produce. So in the, in the first column, uh, which is P, you use the row F, and that gives you a ciphertext of U. Okay. Does this make sense? You're just taking keys on the column, plain text on the rows, and wherever they meet is the ciphertext. OK. Uh, one of the interesting things about this is that the last six characters are all A's. And if you encrypt the, uh, a string of all A's, you'll get something 
that looks like this. Because PSU encrypted by the cipher, the Caesar cipher A will give you the letter back. And so by choosing a string of A's to send through your Visionaire cipher, what happens? It actually reveals what the key is. PSU, PSU. Okay, the reason I'm pointing this out, this is a known attack on encryption schemes called the chosen plain text attack. If the adversary knows it can send a bunch of A's through your enciphering scheme for a Visionaire cipher, the adversary knows it'll reveal the key to, to him or her. So this is actually, remember this kind of attack for the movie, because the imitation game, there's a sort of a known plain text attack that basically reveals the German uh, messages, uh, that, that helps them completely break that encryption scheme. So, and this is an example of that. And uh, this is the kind of adversarial thinking that, that we're hopefully going to instill in you. When, you. when you look at a bunch of jumbled letters, it's easy to think that that's secure, but it, it, it really depends on the assumption, assumptions that you're making on the encryption scheme. Okay, so uh, the, the next thing we're going to talk about is decrypting a visionary message. And I'm gonna, I have to teach you this because then you're going to do an exercise to decrypt a visionary message. Uh, so you're given the cipher text, and again, this is what we had before, UG, IQ, um, et cetera. And the, the way to decrypt this message is to, as before, cycle the key across the cipher text. And the algorithm for decrypting is, again, the, the character of the key selects the column. And then what you would do is you would find in that column where the cipher text is. And in this case, it's P. And the ciphertext is U. So you go down this column, and you go down to where the ciphertext appears. And then if you go across on that row, that is the original plain text. So it's basically the opposite function to decrypt the uh, Visionaire message. So you take the column P, you go down to U, and then you get to F. The next one is the key letter is S, so you take the column S, you go down to the cipher text, with the, which is G, and then the row that it appears in is O, so then the plain text is O, and you finally can regenerate this if you keep on going. Uh, a teacher from a couple camps ago said the best thing that you can do to remember this decryption thing is to remember a backwards L. So when you're decrypting visionary messages, you're using this backward L to generate the plain text. So to give you some practice, I have a decryption activity. Uh, the visionary key I'm going to give you is CyberDisk. And you are going to, every snippet is encrypted with this key. I want you to decrypt your snippet, and then again, put all the plain texts together generate the quote that uh, uh, it, it has. Okay, so these are the handouts. And I have, uh, I have three Visionaire tables per table, so you're going to have to share, hope, uh, and hopefully that's not a problem. Uh, the one thing is to try and keep a Visionaire table. So uh, you're going to need it for the homework, so keep the Visionaire table after you're done using it. Don't, th don't throw it away. Okay, so here's a really hard question. How do you break the Visionaire cipher? You sort of see how it operates. Is there any just general approach for trying to break this thing? Any ideas? Uh, so, the vulnerability of a Visionaire cipher is that it's reusing that Caesar cipher, that key, over and over again. So, how many Caesar cipher alphabets are being used in that message I just gave you? Uh, there, yeah, 26 different positions, but you're actually picking how many different columns did you use out of that table? Three. There's only three different Caesar ciphers 
that are being used on that entire message. Uh, you're cycling the key over and over again on your plain text to generate your ciphertext. So, this is a vulnerability. Uh, here is the letter frequency. Oh, sorry, there's CyberDis has. I was thinking of, I'm sick in the PSU example, which only had three. No wonder everyone's like, what the heck is he talking about? So that was my mistake. It's, for the PSU example, there were just three. For the example I just gave you, there's eight. Just to make cyber disk. So. Yes. Okay, so uh, the problem with even the cyber disk is that you're using uh, only eight Caesar ciphers. And so here is a, a graph of the this is the uh, simple plain text analysis of the US Constitution. This is the letter frequency of um, the English characters in that document. And you see E-T-A-S-O-N. You see that you had something similar with the table before. Uh, what you can do is for the Visionaire cipher, you can look at every eighth letter of the, con uh, of the US Constitution that's been encrypted with CyberDisk. And if you look at this frequency, you see that it follows the exact same pattern as you had when it was not encrypted. And so for here, if you take every eighth letter and you do an analysis, you can see that if the eighth, uh, every eighth letter is a G, you can map that to a T, or map that to an E. And so you have eight Caesar ciphers that you just have to break in order for you to figure out what the plain text is. That's really tough. But does anyone, does that make sense to people or it does? Okay. So that's how you would break it. And this is a problem. Whenever you have that key, that key has a finite length and that constrains the security of your encryption scheme. So this is going to lead you to the enigma. And so the Visionaire cipher was turn of the century in World War I. And these were the ciphers that Elizabeth Friedman was initially breaking. Uh, but eventually, people realized that with a fixed key, the Visionaire cipher can be broken quite easily. And this leads to these rotor machines uh, that are based on, um, and I'll show you a picture of this, but the enigma is, was this sort of the pinnacle of encryption around World War II. And it tried to get rid of this limitation. It said, I'm not going to just use eight different alphabets. I'm going to use as many as possible. So the idea is to never repeat a permutation and to always generate a new mapping for every single character that you encrypt. Uh, so the heart of the enigma is this thing called a rotor. And the rotor has a fixed permutation of A through Z to scrambled letters. So it's sort of like a substitution cipher built into a rotor, but it's fixed, okay? Uh, this rotor can be rotated, and we'll see why this matters in a second. Uh, this is a picture of what it looks like. So in the outer, you see the, the number of leads around the circle are 26 characters, or 26 letters. And then in, internally, there is a mapping from these terminals on the outside here to the terminals on the other side, and this is going to give you the scrambling. And every different rotor has a different scramble. And there's like eight different kinds of rotors in the Enigma. Okay? So, uh, the next part of the Enigma is that you can take these rotors and you can plug them into each other. And so the one rotor will give you a permutation. It will map to the next rotor, which will give you a different scramble, which will map to the next rotor, which will give you another scramble. Uh, if you had two rotors, and again, these things can be rotated against each other. Uh, if you have two rotors, how many different combinations can you make out of that? How many different mappings of plain text to ciphertext can you get with two rotors? 26 times 26. So you have 26 positions uh, on the right that can be mapped into 26 positions. And so it's a co combinatorial explosion in the number of combinations you can, you can take with this uh, rotor. So it's 26 times 26. So the initial enigma had three rotors that you could put side by side. 
Um, and the way this works, so here's a picture of it. Uh, you have, you have um, three wheels, and they're, they're plugged right next to each other so that the, the mapping of one will lead into the mapping of the other, which will lead into a mapping of another. So you're scrambling it three times based on the rotors and based on the rotation of the rotor. Okay. And the idea here is that every time you encrypt a single letter using this rotor, um, the algorithm is, is that the rightmost rotor, wheel three, will always rotate on every character. And when the rightmost rotor makes a full revolution, the rotor in the middle will rotate one position. It's sort of like counting. And when the rotor in the middle does a full sequence all the way around, the rotor on the left will move one position. And so over time, you're getting a new combination of rotor positions for every single character that you type into the Enigma machine. So given this, how many characters can you send through this system before you get a repeating permutation? 26 to, 26 to the third power. That's good math. Yes, so that is 17,576 different combinations before you get a rotor position that is identical to the very first position. So how many messages are over 17,000 17, characters long? Well, not very many. And this is why every single message, and you'll see this in the movie, anytime they got a new message, uh, you pretty much have to start from scratch, right? Because you're, you're, you're not able to, to reuse any of the work on one character to the next, potentially, unless you do something smarter. Okay, so here is a full picture of this. I'm good? Okay. So uh, the rest of this, this machine, and I know this, this figure doesn't show up very well, which is if you, if you have it down uh, on your laptop, this is a better thing to see. Um, so there are three rotors in that machine, and you can select from eight different kinds. And so operationally, they would tell the, the person running the Enigma machine remotely that, hey, these are the rotors I'm going to use. Uh, these are the positions of the rotor. So not only do I have to pick three out of the eight, I have to say which position are the rotors being placed. Um, and so one of, the, one of the other things about this machine is that there's this plug board that also does a permutation. And uh, the idea here is that you, you plug in the, the plain text into this keyboard, and it runs through this plug board, goes through all the wheels, and encrypts your message. Now, one of the design features of the Enigma was that they wanted the same circuit to both encrypt and decrypt the messages. So there's this thing called a reflector. And the reflector will take the output of, of the left wheel and send it back through to generate the ciphertext on the other side. And so this is actually what, um, something that weakens the overall operation of the Enigma. But the key, and I wanted to show you all the parts of the Enigma, because when you are encrypting and decrypting messages using the Enigma, you need to know all of the different parts of it. Okay, so the key for Enigma, and this is what they would have to send to anyone operating an Enigma machine, are the rotors that are being used. So which three of the eight rotors are being used? And so these are the three rotors in the middle. The ordering of the rotors in the machine the initial rotational position of the rotor. So you have to get everybody on the same page is basically what you're doing. You have to configure this machine exactly the same way from the sender to the receiver. Uh, and then the last part is this plugboard permutation, the last part of the uh, encryption and decryption scheme. So um, that is the Enigma machine. Um, there are several things about the Enigma that weakened it, and you'll see this in the movie. Uh, the first one is that the leftmost rotor rarely moves, that you need a, a whole bunch of messages, 26 times 26 messages, before that left rotor actually does anything. And so you only really need to break two rotors at any point in time uh, with the Enigma. Um, 
And that's what they, a computer, like if you're writing a program to break an Enigma message, you can leverage that. You can leverage the fact that the, the, that last rotor is basically not gonna be uh, moved at all. Um, the other problem is that reflector that I showed you, one of the features of this reflector is that it prevents a letter from encrypting to itself. Like a T can never be encrypted into the letter T. Uh, and, and that's just a property I'm just gonna have to have you accept. Uh, but the, the key to this is that uh, if you know that a plain text cannot map into a certain uh, cipher text, then if you know any characteristic of the message, like for example, if the message that is being encrypted is hello, if you have, if you send that into the system and you get a cipher text back that has an H as the first character, you know that that's an incorrect position. So if every single cipher text message that you know has an H at the beginning and you get back the ciphertext that has an H, you know that that's an impossible combination. And so this reflector makes it so that you can throw out a whole bunch of Enigma combinations uh, in, in when, you're, when you're trying to break it. And this is the pivotal moment in the movie. So the, when they realize that this is happening, when somebody is sending the exact same mes message on the Enigma over and over again, they can use that message to throw away a whole bunch of combinations on the Enigma machine. So, um, the last weakness that I want to talk about is key distribution. In order for you to synchronize between the sender and the receiver for Enigma, you have to generate these key sheets, and then you have to send them everywhere. And this is what the Germans had to do. They had these Enigma key sheets, which you see here, and uh, if the allies would capture any of these key sheets, they would be able to decrypt Enigma messages for as long as these key sheets uh, lasted. And so for this key sheet, every single row is a new day. And those were the settings that the Germans were using on that Enigma machine for that day. And so uh, this happened in World War II a lot, where they were just capturing these sheets and then decrypting the messages directly. Okay, so the last thing I want to do is the Enigma activity. I want you to try out decrypting an Enigma uh, message. So uh, uh, the the story here is the, uh, an intelligence organization has captured the key settings for an Enigma machine being used by a nefarious professor at Portland State. Uh, he sent this message yesterday. Uh, can you help us decode it? And so this is the, this is the message. And uh, if you can get your computers out, I'm gonna have you decode these messages. And as part of the captured key sheet, it's a list of Enigma settings given by every day. Um, and uh, I am going to give you that today is day 30. So I don't want you to figure that part out. Uh, the Enigma machine that will simulate Enigma decryption and encryption is at this URL, and this URL is also here. If you go to the CyberPDX, the crypto homepage, the Enigma, um, the Enigma, Enigma emulator that you, you're gonna use to decrypt this message is over here on the bottom right. And I want you to set the settings of this machine up to decrypt this message. And so as part of this interface, you're gonna say, this is an M3 Enigma type. Uh, this is the, uh, one of the, the, let's see, this is the reflector setting. Uh, these are the wheel settings, and these are the original positions of the wheels. And so this is all part of your key sheet. This is the uh, plug board settings that you're given on the sheet. Uh, the one thing I want you to do is when you uh, enter in this ciphertext, enter this in as a block of text. It's much easier than doing it character at a time. So you can type in the ciphertext down here and then do the encryption and decryption. Um, the other thing is, is one of the, th one of the things, once you set these uh, machine settings, like say this is going to be two, three, and four, uh, this helps you if you make mistakes. So if I do, and then if I do this for my settings, A, B, and C, D, E, and F, 
If I want to save these settings so that uh, I have them set for next time, I can click this and it creates me a link that I can bookmark. So I recommend doing this because if you make a mistake, you want to reset your machine. Uh, and that's, that's how you reset your machine. So now, now when I click this link, I have my settings for this machine. Oh, I thought I had it saved off, but... Um, that didn't work. Save settings, and then drag this over, and then it's saved. So set up your machine first, and then save the settings before you try and decrypt it. Oh, sorry. Yes? Uh, the settings are on the key sheet. Use day 30. I don't want you to calculate the day to use. I'm going to give you the day. It's day 30 today. Um, or no, uh, use day 30 is, is what I want you to, to use. So this is the setting. This is the setting I want you to use, the day 30. So it's up here on the, on the uh, Prezi as well. Okay, I'm going to go through how you set up this emulator. I think there's some confusion as to how to uh, set the settings based on the key sheet. So on the, on the sheet, you have day 30. And day 30 has a setting of B for the reflector, which is already set with B. And the wheels here are 3, 1, and 7. So this is a 3. This is a 1. This is a 7. The ring setting is U, E, and I. The ground setting is A, H, and M. And the plug board setting, if you look at that, it's A goes to V, F goes to U, G goes to L, K goes to I, M goes to Y, N goes to B, Q goes to R, oh wait, P goes to D, T goes to E, and W goes to Z. And then what I want you to do is save this in case you make any mistakes. So this is the, the link to save. And then this is the, the thing that you're going to add to your bookmarks. So I'm going to take this and move it to my bookmarks. And then I'll have these settings saved so that when I click on them, I have those settings in here. And then I will go to a block of text, and then I'll enter in the ciphertext. And that's what I want you to do. You enter the ciphertext in this block of text at the bottom. Yeah. So then I can do, uh, what is the first couple of letters? Um, MQDL. And then I can hit this button to encipher that. And I get EVER as the first letter of the plain text. So 